when it comes to following the Lord Jesus Christ, there can be times that we can be confused in our calling, as in who we are and what we are to do for the Lord. Things like questions we might ask ourselves is, how to live? How do we live for God in this world? How do we witness? How do we serve? How do we grow in the things of God? All these questions will at times come to our heart and more. But I suppose this is normal and it's, it's often seen throughout history, especially the history of the church. I want to quote you this morning as way of introduction from Micah chapter 6. For what I see here is a, a confused Israel. The people of God and they're somewhat confused as in who they are and just as importantly how they are to serve the Lord with their life. Listen to what they say. With what shall I come before the Lord? There's the question. Then it gets a wee bit more radical as it goes on. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? I guess that's okay, but it begins to get a bit more radical. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? It gets a wee bit extreme at this point. But then it gets worse than that and it goes on to say, Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul. A confused people indeed. And with this confusion, the Lord sends his prophet Micah, who speaks into this and he says, he says this in Micah 6 and verse 8, Has the Lord not told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? And I guess there's no better example for us this morning than the humble rooster that taught Peter the importance of humility in service. If you're confused what you're to do for the Lord, we're to walk, we're to serve him in a spirit of humility and let him use us for his glory. So let us read together Luke chapter 22, verses 31, just four verses this morning. Simon, Simon, it starts off with, who of course is Peter. So Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan is demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But then Peter said to, to Jesus, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. But then Jesus says to him, Peter, I tell you this, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times before man. As we go through this, later we will see that a few verses later, Jesus has been handed over to an angry mob. And among this mob, there's the chief elders, there's the priests, and these are all being led by Judas, who was one of the 12 who betrayed, betrayed Jesus with a kiss. There wasn't much humility found in Judas. Judas sat with the Lord. He ate with the Lord. He was part of his ministry. But somewhere along the line, the spirit of pride set in. And what we see here is that when they took Jesus, they led him to the house of a high priest called Caiaphas. And Peter, we, we are told, followed at a distance. And when they came to the house of the high priest, the crowd outside had lit a fire to keep themselves warm. And as the people gathered around the fire, we are told that Peter too slipped in to keep warm. And as he stood there before the fire, over a period of a few hours, three different people would ask Peter if he was one of Jesus' disciples. Each time, as the Lord had prophesied, Peter denied him. And when the last person insisted that Peter was one of the Lord's disciples, we see that Peter gets somewhat angry and I guess fearful. And in verse 60, we see the true heart come out. And it's the heart of man. And Peter says this, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And after that, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And here's where Peter gets a lesson. Which Peter at that moment remembered the saying of the Lord. And how he had said to him, before the rooster, rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. We're told this, church, that Peter went out and he wept bitterly. So, Father, we thank you 
for your word this morning. We pray that, Lord, you would speak to each of our hearts. Father, as a church, we, Lord, seek to see great things done for the glory of God. Father, for each family, each person in this church, Father, Lord, it's our desire to see each person flourish and go on in the things of God. And, Father, we believe you're going to do great things. And, Lord, we just ask this morning, Lord, as you continue to move in our life, in our homes, in our businesses, Lord, in our church, that, Father, you would guard us with a spirit of humility. That, Lord, we would not think more of ourselves than we ought. But, Lord, we would be mindful of who we are, where we have come from, and who it is indeed that we serve. Father, I pray you would bless us this morning with a fresh revelation of, Lord, where we once stood and where we now stand in Christ. And, Lord, we would leave this assembly this morning filled to overflowing and built up, Lord, with, in our faith, Lord, and with a spirit of humility to go forth in the name of of Jesus with the gospel. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And amen. Church, there's a way we are to walk as the people of God. We are to walk in the strength of the Lord, as we looked at a few weeks ago. And with that strength that we find in the Lord, we attach that to a spirit of humility. What we see here in verse 31 is that Jesus warns Peter. He warns him that to follow him will prove difficult in this world. And I guess if, if you've followed Jesus in any level at all, you will know that to be true in your own life, in your own ministry. The Bible teaches very clearly, and, and Jesus speaks on it in this very text, that God has an enemy. And all who follow Christ will to inherit this enemy. An enemy that will use pride, greed, and lust. He will use discouragement, pain, and sorrow, and many, many other things, both to keep men from following Christ and to keep men from coming to Christ. That's the work of the enemy in this world. And Jesus warns Peter of this enemy of the church. Now listen to what he says to Peter, because Peter didn't hear it. Peter, Satan has asked to have you, but Peter totally missed it. He, he didn't feel that there was any room in his heart for anything else to get in. He felt strong, and, and that's good to feel strong, but there was a wee bit of humility had left him. Peter, Jesus says, Satan has asked to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. To sift wheat is to shake it so hard that it's to separate the wheat from the chaff. In other words, to separate the fruit, the wheat from the impurities, the earthly impurities. And what Satan desired to do was to, to shake Peter so hard that his faith would fail him. From going to be a mighty man of God to be totally broken and shattered. To take away his godliness, which, which would be the fruit of his salvation, and to replace it with the impurities that are often displayed in the fleshly man. And what I would see here, if Satan gets his way in a life like this, what, what you will see is a man who is saved, but acting in the flesh. Does that make sense? A man who is truly saved, but at the present situation that he finds himself in, He's acting in the flesh. And, and in that moment, Jesus reassures Peter, and therefore the church as well. As he says, Peter, Satan has asked to have you, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And there's the assurance and the encouragement we can get from that. Yes, there will be times that we may fall. There may be times that we may need to get a wee lesson from the Lord. But in it all, he never let us fall too far. He never let us go so far that we can't come back. He goes on to say this to Peter, he says, and notice the wording, and when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. When you've turned again from what? Well, Peter is about to go through a hard lesson, a lesson in humility, and it's ahead of him, and he's about to get broken by it, but the Lord knows that he's going to come through it. And he says, now, Peter, when you have turned again, come back again, go and strengthen your brothers. And church, before we move on, I want to say this to you. The path of suffering that that you have traveled in your life thus far, the shaking that you have encountered in your life, will one day, if it hasn't been already, be used by you to strengthen others in the faith who are going through similar situations. So that's what God does. He brings us and he allows us to go through certain things that when we come through the other end of it, we will be able to encourage and help and build up other people who are suffering. But what I see is that in it all, 
in all that we go, go through, God will bring us through it. Because there's times that we feel we're not going to go through it. We're not going to make it to the other side. But what we see here clearly is God will bring us through. And it's all backed up. It's guaranteed by this that Christ is praying for us, that we not fail. And we should be encouraged in that. But we must remain under his wing of protection. And that's where I want to bring us to today. <clears throat> Excuse me, because the moment we lift our own head in pride, or we believe that we have made it either in his kingdom or this world, the enemy will pounce on us and ultimately seek to devour. Now, Peter found this out for himself firsthand. Because after Jesus warns Peter, and he says Satan about Satan, he says that you need to humble yourself in the Lord for service. But Peter begins to boast. I guess he feels that he's able to face all that Satan could ever throw at him. And can I say this, um, church, be careful of these days. Now, albeit, they're very rare. There's not too many days we feel so strong in our faith that we would say, Satan, come on, I'm ready for an arm wrestle. I understand that. But there will be times where we will perhaps feel a wee bit more about ourselves than we ought. A wee bit more cocky, a wee bit more stronger. Perhaps as the Bible defines it, arrogant even in, in our own calling. And the Bible warns us about this for our own good. Things when we start to say what Peter says is, Lord, don't, don't worry about Satan. Because you know what? I'm going to follow you regardless. I'm going to die for you, Lord. I'm going to go to prison. It doesn't matter, Lord. Don't, don't be worrying. I'm grand. I will do whatever it takes because I'm unstoppable, I guess. And I guess that's how Peter felt at that moment. He was unstoppable. And you know why? He was close to Jesus. He was by his side. And when we get close to the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no doubt about it. There's a part of us that, that we just sense the, the leading and the power of what it is to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter felt somewhat in tune and yet unstoppable in the things of God. He was on fire for God, church, and thank God that he was. But there is a lesson. And the lesson is found in Peter's response. Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. See, he allowed himself to begin to be filled with, I guess, spiritual pride. And what we see here is Jesus seeing Peter's error. Peter's era. He wants to teach him early on. So when he learns the importance of humility, Peter will go on to accomplish great things for the kingdom of God, which, by the way, he does. But at this point, Peter is filled with pride and therefore he's in a very dangerous position, church. Be careful of the I in our ministries. Peter says, I will go to prison for you, Lord. I will die for you, Lord. I will do this for you, Lord. Be careful, church, of the I in our conversation. The I in our conversation is, quite simply put, the work of Satan. And it's that work that leads us to pride. I have accomplished this. I have done that. Be very careful. We all can, can quite easily use the word I. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Speaking to the church, let him who thinks he stands take heed, at least he falls. In Proverbs 16 and 18, we're told by Solomon that pride comes before destruction. So it goes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. And here we see firsthand the importance and the need for humility in the church. Because Peter is allowed at this moment pride to enter his heart. And you know what? He's about to fall as the, as, as the Psalms or Solomon says in Proverbs. And Jesus says this to Peter. The rooster will not crow this day until you've denied me three times. And later on in verse 61, Peter indeed did deny Christ. And as he denied him the third time, we are told that while he was still speaking, while he was still denying Christ, this shows you how, how much control the Lord has and what he knows. Because he hadn't got the last denial out of his mouth and the rooster crowed. And we're told that the Lord Jesus looked at Peter and at that moment, Peter, Peter remembered the saying of the Lord and how he had said to him, Peter, before the rooster, rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. 
men were told that Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Now, church, listen, please listen, because there's something in these tears. These tears were tears of great sorrow. They were tears of great pain and shame because he had just denied the Lord Jesus Christ whom he loved dearly. But understand what Jesus is doing here. Because sometimes in our, in our situation, we, we, we think, Lord, what are you doing here? Don't we? We, we can find ourselves going, this, this just does not add up at all. But yet what we see here, I'm sure Peter wondered what was going on in his life in his ministry. How could he come from such a, a high position and he was in a high place of authority? He walked closely with the Lord. He was in the inner circle. And here he is denying the Lord Jesus three times as the Lord told him he would. You must understand that the Lord is working in Peter's life as he's working in your life and my life. For these tears that Peter shed, what they did was something wonderful. They turned a godly man filled with pride into a godly man filled with faith and humility. Them tears were powerful. They were life-altering. They changed this man into something wonderful to be used of God. And that brings us to the humble rooster. Because here's my, my theory. If a humble rooster can be used of God, well then, there's hope for you and I. Isn't that right? If an old rooster can be used greatly of God, there's hope for you, there's hope for me. So I'm going to share some observations from a rooster to help us this morning in some discipleship. If you're taking notes, there's going to be some points here. And I say, these points I, I gleaned from another man. I've added my own thoughts to them, but, but certainly I thought it was just worth sharing this morning. And the first thing we learn about this humble rooster is this, that the rooster simply did what he could for the Lord. How about that? Just do what we can for the Lord. The rooster, we're told, crowed. He didn't try to write books, church. He didn't try to preach the gospel from, from a grand stand in the middle of the street or plant churches all over the world. He simply crowed. And here's my application for that to you this morning. Don't try to be someone else, but just be who God has created you to be because you're wonderful just as you are. Don't try to be someone else. Consider the young David, not yet king, who put on Saul's armor he didn't have it on two seconds. He took it off and he sat it to the side. You see, David, even in his youth, understood that David wasn't Saul. And as one man went on to put it, the rooster did not try to bark like a dog or talk like a parrot, but simply crowed like a rooster. Church, do what you can for God. Don't try and do what others do. The scripture tells us quite clearly that some are called to be evangelists, some are called to be teachers and pastors. But every man and every woman has their own calling. Amen? Everybody has their own calling. Don't try and be somebody else. I remember at college there was one guy, greatly gifted. He was going on to do his master's. And we, we always were asking him because he could, he could preach the gospel or preach the Bible very clearly. And we were, we were asking him, where do you see yourself going? Are you going to go to lecture? Are you going to go to be a minister? And he says, no, I believe my minister is that of Paul Washer." Well, with that, I just walked on out of the room because Paul Washer's ministry belongs to who, church? Paul Washer. It does not belong to any other man or woman. And I understood Paul Washer because we all thought something, oh, I wouldn't mind a wee bit of that minister because he stirred people up. He got a reaction, but listen, you need to live the life that Paul Washer lives to preach the messages that Paul Washer preaches. Don't try to be anybody else only the, the, the person that God has called you to be. The second point, expect rejection in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be reminded of this because ministry is hard, church, isn't it? Living for the Lord Jesus is hard at times. Expect rejection in serving the Lord. Let me just put it this way in my own simple term, terms. There's nothing more annoying, at least to me, than the crowing of a roast rooster when you're trying to sleep. Have you ever experienced that? The old rooster crowing away. And it may be 12 o'clock in the daytime. Not even the right time in the morning, but crowing away. And likewise, church, there's nothing more annoying to the sinner than the crowing of the gospel message. Expect rejection 
if you really want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is not well received. It wasn't well received by this old heart at a time. I guess it wasn't well received in your old heart at a time. But boy, do we rejoice this morning because of it. The gospel, it's, it's like the crowing rooster. After a while, it becomes very common. People don't listen the way they used to. And like the preaching of the gospel, it often goes unnoticed in a land. But listen, preaching the gospel, the Bible says, is seen by the world as foolish. So church, don't be offended if your witness is scoffed at or you're mocked for God. Unfortunately, it comes with a calling. There's no way out of it. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 1 and 18, for the message of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God unto salvation. See, the word of God stirs and quickens the soul of the believer, but it often makes the sinner angry. So Christian, as you serve Jesus with your life, expect rejection in your ministry. His crowing message was often unwelcomed. And that is the work of the gospel. It's not often well received. Our third point this morning is don't, don't be ashamed. Because what we see here that this rooster was not ashamed. Because the Bible says, when, now remember there's a picture. There's the mob. There's all these angry people there. And then you hear this, this, crow, this rooster just crowing before them all. He wasn't ashamed of the crowd. And here's what I see. Embarrassment of the gospel. It often comes when we, when we have been saved for a few years, doesn't it? The early days of our salvation, we, we can't stop talking about him. But when we get a wee bit on in the faith, we, we get a wee bit more refined in who we are and our crowing becomes somewhat weakened. We stop waking up the sleepy sinners and telling them their need of salvation church let us not stop crowing and waking up the sleepy sinners who need to know about the lord jesus christ and their need of salvation so believer don't be ashamed of the gospel consider what god has done in your own life and encourage yourself in it the apostle paul himself he suffered with a feeling of shame i believe in his preaching and i see it in romans 1 and 16 and i believe here paul is is fighting that inner voice. Um, you know that part of us where shall we tell this person about the Lord, shall we pray for him? Or there's, a, there's, there's a bit of shame there. And I see that, I believe I see this in, in Paul. And Paul concludes and he says this, listen, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why did he say them words, I'm not ashamed? He had to at least wrestle with the thought in order for him to say them words. And he concluded, look, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And I'm not ashamed. And here's what I see. The old enemy that tried to take down Peter. He wants the church to be ashamed of the gospel. Because he too understands it is the power to save men. And he wants all the crowing to stop. But the rooster was not ashamed and he kept on crowing. The fourth point, he was faithful. He was faithful. In a day where there's so much unfaithfulness in every area of society, here we see a wee rooster that was faithful to the call of God in his life. One commentator put it this way. The rooster crowed at the given time regardless of what was happening around it. You don't want to say he crowed whether he felt like it or not. He crowed regardless of the weather. He remained faithful. And for each believer comes the call to be faithful in the work of the ministry, regardless of the season that we find ourselves in. It's hard to share Jesus when we're not in a good season. It's hard to share Christ when everybody around us seems to be scoffing at the very name. But Paul, teaching young Timothy, the importance of remaining faithful in service in a season where it was very difficult for Timothy. And he says this to him, listen, there's if you read in context, it was nothing but ungodliness and heresy all around. And, 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 and Paul says to, to Timothy, listen, this is how you deal with this. You preach the word. Don't stray from it. Remain faithful to it. Because only the word can change the season. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience 
patience. What a word. And teaching. And the word of God. To be faithful, quite simply put, church is this. To be ready in all seasons to point people to Jesus Christ. Amen. Now lastly, the fruit of the humble rooster's ministry. What's the fruit that we should be seeing as a church? Well, here's what the, what the fruit of the, what the rooster seen. He woke people up. Because that's what the gospel does. It wakes people up from their sleepiness of sin. And that's the job of the rooster. The message of the gospel wakes people up to the reality of their situation before God. See, the world, it makes plans for tomorrow without a thought that tomorrow is not promised them. That's the way of the transgressor. And that's why people need to be woke up with the blasting of the gospel. Now, Satan has blinded the minds of the world, causing the world to deny God and to make sin acceptable. He's blinded the world to the goodness of God and his salvation. We need to tell people about the goodness of God and his salvation. When we were all spent, where was the Lord? Right there to lift us up. Sometimes we get the gospel so confused that it's the hell fire that we pour out, but we forget to tell them how long there's one that's going to lift you up out of the pit. There's one that wants to lift you up out of the pit. And that's the gospel, the good news of the gospel. And that's the call of the church to go forward and to open the eyes of the blind, to wake up the sinner from their sin and point them to Jesus Christ to be saved. But listen, the few times that I have heard the rooster crow, the only thing that comes to my mind is where's the shotgun? It's an iron wee animal. And I guess that the, the rooster has made more people angry than any other animal, I suspect. And so it should be with the most faithful church. The church that is faithful, her message will at times make people angry. And I'm all for, as you will know by now, of making the church very welcoming. Make sure that people can come in and go out and be spoken to and to be known and to be helped in whatever way we can help people. But can we really afford to turn a blind eye to the crowing of the gospel? A man's need to repent, of course. We can't under times the message of the gospel. Well, it says for itself it's offensive. Because why? It addresses that which is hidden within us. Mainly that all have sinned against God and all need to be saved for all sin is going to be judged. That's what we need to be saved from. And people don't want to be told this. But Jesus says to the faithful church, listen, it's going to cost you. It's going to be difficult following me. And you need to know. You need to know this because you need to walk in humility. And I'm going to pray for you and you're going to go forward. The minute you try to do it by yourself is the minute you're going to fall. And he says this in John 16, they will put you out of the synagogue. They'll chase you off the pulpits. They'll close your churches down. In fact, the time is going to come when anyone who kills you because of me will think they're offering God a great service. This rooster didn't receive much in the way of encouragement, by the way. It often stood alone, despised and rejected as Christ did. And to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, in my own experience at and certainly in the experience of many that I've read, it's a lonely job. At times, ministry can be lonely. Not too often will encouragement come your way, church. There will be times when you will feel deserted. Times you'll feel tired and weak in spirit. But at these times, let us consider the humble rooster. Who looked for no encouragement. Who stood alone among the mob and did simply what he was called to do. Isn't it wonderful what you can get out of a wee rooster? I want to close with this. I want to point you to the Apostle Paul. Here's a man that, by the way, was humbled by God. A man so filled with pride. In fact, a man that thought he was doing God a service to kill Christians. It's ironic. But God humbled him. And because God crushed this man and humbled this man, the most of the New Testament is attributed to Paul. He's probably the most quoted man when anybody's preaching from the New Testament. That's what it is to be humbled by God, is to be used of God when we come through the other side. And this man was humbled by God. He was filled with Jesus. See, if you get filled with Jesus, nothing else matters as much. Paul often stood alone, and he certainly did what he was called to do for God. Let me quote his own words for you. 2 Timothy 4 and 16. 
At my first defense, Paul says, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. They listened to his heart, but may it not be charged against them. Then he goes on to say, and he uses that word, but. He says, when everybody else failed me, when everybody else deserted me, he says, but the Lord stood by me. And here's the key to it. Here's the key to remaining faithful to the Lord is walking in a spirit of humility and walking close to the Lord, trusting in him. Because Paul could say through all he was through that in it all, the Lord stood with him. And the Lord strengthened him. He goes on to say that through me, the message might be proclaimed fully to the Gentiles. See, Paul found out what Peter would later find out. And all who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ have learned that even when pride at times will fill our heart, in times when we perhaps go our own way, when things become perhaps too difficult for us and we start to regress, that Jesus stands by his people. He humbles, but he strengthens. Church, did you get that? He humbles us, but he will strengthen us. He breaks us, but he rebuilds us stronger like Peter. And the end result is this, that through ordinary, humble people of God, the message of the gospel might be fully proclaimed to all the world. That's the end result. So Christian, consider the humble, insignificant rooster. Let us learn from it as Peter did, because Peter was humbled by a rooster. He did what he could for Jesus. And by doing so, he brought Peter to his knees in repentance. You don't need to be mighty to bring people to their knees in repentance. Just be humble in the Lord and preach the gospel. His crowing was unpopular. He didn't stop. He was not ashamed of the gospel. Discouragement set in, but it didn't stop him. And he remained faithful to his calling. Has he not told you, O oh man, what is good? What does the Lord require of you but to do justice? to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Lord God, that, Lord, you are a wonderful, mighty warrior. So, too, is your church. But, Lord, your church is not called to fight in a carnal way. We've seen that, Lord God, in the garden. It was that Peter cut the ear off the, the soldier, Lord, how you healed it. Lord, you have not come, Lord, to, to crush men, but to save men. And Lord, you have come, Lord God, to show unworthy, ungodly sinners such as us unbelievable mercy and grace and humility. Father, we think back <coughs> to <coughs> excuse me, think back to Easter. And Lord, that Palm Sunday, how the Lord Jesus Christ Himself rode into Jerusalem and we humble donkey. That's the way of the godly. That's the way that leads men to salvation. That path of humility. And in that path, the church is mighty. Lord, I pray over each of our hearts, each of our ministries, Lord, each ministry within this church, over each department head, that, Father, each of us, Lord, would Lord, leave here today, Lord, touched by God, Lord, and filled with the spirit of humility. Lord, knowing, Lord God, your presence, knowing that, Father, even in them hard times, that, Lord, you stood with us. Lord, that you strengthened us. And, Lord, you still used us to bring the gospel to a world that's dying. Glory to God. Father, we thank you, Lord, that in you are all things. Lord, and we don't need to strive. Father, we simply just be the church. So, Lord, I pray over each heart this morning. Lord, wherever each person would be, Lord, that you would just remind them and quicken them. Lord, that you are with them. That, Lord God, there's nothing, Lord, that is happening in their life that isn't of you. And there is a plan in it. And Lord, even though that plan might seem obscure at the moment, Lord, there's a day coming and Lord, it'll all make sense. And Father, every lesson, Lord, every humbling that we have ever received or will receive, Lord, will be used to make us stronger and greater in the kingdom of God. But at all the same time, Lord, our head will be down. But yet our eyes will be up to the Lord, looking at him and to him alone. And may we not trust and our own strength. So, Father, we pray, would you bless us now as we come around the table. We thank, Lord God, of where the Lord Jesus went. So arrogant sinners as we once were, 
that now come around Lord, the, the Lord's table with a thankful heart and a spur of humility to give him glory for the great things that he has done. Amen. Amen. Church, I'm going to ask the team just to come now. We're going to come.